excited to see you. Hopefully others will come and they'll join with us, but that might depend on your singing and mine. So I want you right from the start to sing out as we sing some of these lovely hymns and choruses to the praise of our God. All hail King Jesus is our first one. All hail Emmanuel, King of Kings, Lord of Lords, bright morning star. This is a short one, so we'll sing it through twice. This is one we sing often on a Sunday night to open our meeting, but let's sing it together, remaining seated again. Years I spent in vanity and pride, caring not my Lord was crucified, knowing not it was for me he died on Calvary. Let's sing this together.
that's where mission all begins, isn't it? Not only in the heart of God, but remember that the Lord Jesus Christ, the only Son of God, was sent into the world to die, and he in turn sends us into the world and to tell people about Calvary, to tell them about the life of discipleship, to tell them about heaven, and oh, what a great privilege that is. What a responsibility it also is. All the way my Saviour leads me, what have I to ask beside? Can I doubt his tender mercy, who through life has been my guide? this morning we've been challenged by the word of God about giving God our best, about putting the Lord Jesus Christ first, about making ourselves available for the Lord Jesus Christ to use. This lovely little hymn as we finish tonight, our hymn singing for the start says, where he may lead me, I will go. wonder tonight could you say that honestly, whether you're young, whether you're old, could you say wherever he leads me, I will go. I'll go now. I'll go because he wants me to serve him. And I'll do it to the best of my ability. Where he may lead me, I will go. Oh, yeah. 
just take a moment quietly. We'll pray together right at the commencement of our time together, looking to God for his blessing, praying that he'll speak to all of us, speak right into these hearts of ours that we might hear his voice. And in the light of all that the Lord Jesus Christ has done for us, that we might respond tonight, here am I, Lord. Send me, use me, fill me, enable me to give you this life that you have given to me in Christ. Let's just quietly still our hearts and come to God in prayer. Father, we thank you for the privilege tonight to be able to come together like this into this building, able to sing your praise, able to worship at your feet, able to acknowledge the goodness of God toward us and the grace that you have shown to us through our Lord Jesus Christ. Father, we thank you that you are a missionary minded God that you sent your son into the world to be our saviour and in order to be our saviour we thank you that he willingly went to that old rugged cross and laid down his life that we might be saved we thank you that he poured out his own soul unto death and shed his own precious blood we thank you, Father, for the grace and the mercy that you have shown to us. We praise you, our Father, that many of us have come to know the Lord Jesus Christ as our Saviour. And we're so grateful for the knowledge of sins forgiven. We're so grateful for every way that your hand has led us in our journey through life. But, O oh God, our Father, we often stop and we think about life and we think of that little question we thought about on Wednesday evening for what is your life sometimes our father we lament the fact that we haven't served you as well as we should have done sometimes our father we look at our lives and we lament the fact that there have been times that we've wasted time and we've missed opportunities when we haven't been everything that you have wanted us to be. And yet, our Father, we thank you that you're a God of great compassion, a God who is patient with us, who every day gives us a new opportunity to start out afresh. And we're so thankful about that, our Father, and we just praise you that each new day is a new opportunity for us to serve you to the best of our ability. We thank you for the time we spent together already this morning. Thank you, Father, for what Donald brought to us, not just from the Word of God, but also as he shared with us about the work of God out there in the Ukraine. What a great joy to see people, young and old alike, coming to saving faith in the Lord Jesus Christ. Father, what a joy and what a delight it would be for us, not just in this building, but right across this land and further afield right into the heart of this nation and the world in which we live, that we could hear of others coming simply by faith to know the Lord Jesus Christ as their Savior. Father, we thank you that we're saved to serve and we pray, our Father, that you would Show yourself to us tonight through your word. Reveal yourself. Cause us, our Father, to go home and ask you, what is it, Lord, that you would have me to do? So bless each one of us, we pray. Bless, our Father, our time spent together thinking about the work of Baptist missions. We thank you for Mervyn, his wife and family. We thank you for the great work that he does within Baptist missions and for the encourager that he is to many missionaries right across Peru and France, Spain, Ireland, both north and south. And as he comes to share with us this evening, both in word and in all that you've laid upon his heart, we ask our Father that he'll feel at home amongst us. 
that he might know the help of the Holy Spirit. And this evening that our ears and our hearts will be opened so that we might hear God speaking to us through his servant. And Father, that we will make the necessary and the right response as far as the work of missions is concerned. Bless all those who have gathered here in the building, those listening in and home. Remember those who'd love to be here, but they cannot for various reasons, especially those who are sick, those who are elderly. Father, we just commend each of them to you and ask for God's blessing upon them. Hear our prayers then as we come just now before you. We give you thanks for another Lord's Day evening and for the blessing of this day. And we commend the remainder of this night to you praying that in all things your name will be glorified and the Lord Jesus Christ will be exalted. And we ask it all in his precious name. Amen. Amen. Now let me make the announcements first of all and uh, we'll deal with those and then that will free up the rest of the evening as far as our night of mission is concerned. Thank you to all who are gathered in the building. We do appreciate you taking time to come out and join with us, old and young alike, and all of us in between. It's lovely to see you all, and we trust that God will bless us. All those who are listening in at home on Facebook Live, we again thank you for joining with us tonight. Pray that you too will be blessed. Remember that we had Donald and Jacqueline Fleming along this morning from Faith in Action to commence the Missionary Convention not just for today, but in the days that lie ahead of this week. And we were blessed by all that Donald shared with us. And it's lovely tonight to welcome as our speaker, Mervyn Scott, who is our Baptist Missions Director. Mervyn has been with us before on a Sunday for our missionary convention. And Mervyn, you're very welcome tonight as you come amongst us again. And we look forward to what God has led on your heart. Now, there will be an after church fellowship time for all of us, and Merville will be sharing with us again. And uh, please do stay. We are staying here in this building, so if you feel that you must go home after the first part of the service, we will be closing in prayer. And then after that's over, if you feel you have to go home, please do wait for the office bearers to uh, get you out of the building safely. We'll take a little break for five to ten minutes. And uh, sorry, we can't include tea in that, but we'll take a little break and then Peter will come and lead us as we come to our evening session, the after church one. Now, our missionary convention continues each night at 8 p.m. That's Monday through until Thursday. The information sheets with the name of missions and whom they represent, still a number of them out on the table. So please take that with you. I'll not go through all the names, but just to say tomorrow night, Philip Dunn of European Mission Fellowship will be along and he will be sharing with us. That takes us right through to Saturday and Street Calf at 10.30 a.m. meeting for prayer and then out on the streets at 11 o'clock. Now, as Peter reminded us this morning, uh, they have been broken up into different teams. So please do look at that. And if there's any questions, ask Peter about that. That takes us through to next Lord's Day, 10.45 in the morning, our prayer meeting. And this, from now on next Sunday, the prayer meetings will take place up in the upper room where we used to have them prior to lockdown. That's 10.45, 11.30, morning meeting and the breaking of bread. 5.45 again, our prayer meeting. And then 6.30, our gospel meeting. Remember the 10 minutes before each of those meetings, we meet together for some community hymn singing. Our singer next Sunday night will be Helen McGill. I'll be speaking at both services next Lord's Day. Please pray for Peter next Sunday as he preaches in Ballyclare Baptist. Just one preliminary announcement, ladies. Monday the 13th of September at 7.30, we'll see the recommencement of the ladies craft class that will be held in the church hall and don't forget that that's monday the 13th now these are all the announcements they're subject as always to the sovereignty of our god go to stand and sing together a lovely hymn great is the gospel of our glorious god where mercy met the anger of god's wrath. let's stand sing this together and then mervyn's going to come 
and take the rest of the meeting. Well, can I say what a real joy and privilege it is to be back here with you in Banbridge this evening. For those who are here in the building, and I believe those who are watching in at home online, thank you, John, for your very warm welcome, and uh, thank you for having me along this evening. It's a real joy to be with you, and thank you, John, too, personally, for those Monday morning messages on Facebook um, that I don't read them all every week, but when I do read them, uh, it's just that the Lord just touches my heart and they've been a real blessing and encouragement to me, particularly in those days, those Monday mornings when maybe things are a bit more difficult, and uh, just, John, John, that spurring on from God's Word has been a real blessing to me personally, so thank you so much, and particularly in these lockdown times. Uh, isn't it great just to be together? We took all this for granted, didn't we, uh, before lockdown and everything came, but what a joy to be together as believers here uh, this evening. My name is Mervyn Scott, as you know. Uh, you've probably guessed now I'm not from up here. I'm from Dublin uh, originally. Uh, my wife, Karen, is from Belfast, so I'm not all bad. Uh, we met through the work uh, of United Beach Missions. We signed our own Anglo-Irish agreement in 1992. Um, and we have four children, three of whom are now living across the water. Um, my daughter's in Oxford and two sons in London. And our youngest, uh, Joshua, uh, has just started uh, in year 11 in Lurgan College. Um, so he is our last. So value prayer for them. And uh, our eldest uh, and our youngest uh, are uh, professing faith and walking with the Lord. Our two boys in the middle who both had professed faith in the past at this moment in time are not walking with the Lord. So I'd ask you to pray for them. Daniel and Ben are their names, that God would stir their hearts and uh, bring them back to himself if they are his and bring them to himself if they truly are not his. I'm here this evening to represent the work of Baptist Missions. 
Um, and our motto in Baptist Missions is simply this, proclaiming Christ and planting churches. And hopefully you understand what that means. It simply means telling people about the Lord Jesus. We've sung about him this evening already. We've sung his praises. We've sung of his uh, coming into this earth and dying upon the cross for sinful people like you and I, rising again from the dead, and as we just sung a moment or two ago, and coming again one day to gather a people to himself from every kindred and tribe and tongue and nation. And so in Baptist missions, we want to make Christ known. We want to speak of him. We want to uplift him. We want to speak of him and his cross and through his death upon the cross and through his resurrection and calling men and women to come in repentance and faith to him and putting their trust in him. But we don't just want to see people saved, as glorious as that is, and as eternal glory, as eternally uh, uh, wonderful that is. We don't just want to people see, see people saved, we want to pe see people discipled, because the Lord Jesus said, go and make disciples of all nations, baptizing them in the name of the Father, the Son, the Holy Spirit, and teaching them everything I have commanded you. And that can only take place where, in the context that we are in this evening here in this building, in the context of a local church. Now, I don't know the history of Banbridge Baptist Church. I hope some of you do. If you don't or you're a member here, go and find out. But somewhere along the line, God in his providence, goodness and grace, caused this church here in Banbridge to be started, to be planted. Somebody began, some people began to meet together here, prayed, I'm sure, before it ever came into existence, that God would bring it into existence. And here you are today, and you are enjoying the blessing of previous generations who prayed, who gave, who labored, and who saw this church planted. And so we're in the business, not just of making Christ known, but of seeing new churches planted in places where he is not currently worshipped and a door where he's not known. Now, if you forget nothing, if you remember nothing else this evening, I'm going to leave you with three numbers that I may have given you the last time I was here because they haven't changed that significantly down through uh, the last few years. As we sit here in Banbridge Baptist Church this evening, there are 70 towns, at least 70 towns, with populations of 5,000 or more in the Republic of Ireland this evening where there's no known evangelical church. Now, I'm not saying where well, there's no known Baptist church. I'm saying where well, there's no Bible-believing church of any shade or variety, where well, there's maybe not even a Bible study, where well, maybe there's not even a known believer. Seventy towns. There are 700 suburbs and major towns in the land of France this evening where the name of Jesus Christ is not known and worshipped where the gospel is unknown to the people living in those towns and suburbs, where maybe for generations, people as young as the, as the, as the ladies here in the front row to as the oldest person in this room have lived and died and gone into eternity, maybe never having heard once the gospel. Now, young people this evening, we haven't time to do this tonight, but if I was taking a youth fellowship later on, any of you who are, anybody here who's 18 and over, let me just give you this something to do in your mind just very briefly. Think of this for, question for a minute. By the time you were 18, how many times had you heard the gospel? And in many, how many different ways had you heard the gospel? Home, Sunday school, church, Christian union, Bible union, CEF camp, Bible club movement, on the radio, a CD, a tract, a leaf that somebody preaching in the open air. In your mind, mentally think how many times and in how many ways you had the opportunity to hear about Jesus Christ. And if you're here this evening and you've had all those opportunities and you've never come to put your faith in him, well, now is the time to do it. Because think of all those times you've had to come to Jesus. But there are men and women not living too far from here, if we all got in our cars and drove a couple of hours, maybe less, we could come to towns and villages and places where there are people, boys and girls, teenagers, older people, who've never heard the gospel explained once. Once. Oh, they've heard of Jesus. They maybe use his name as a swear word every day. They've maybe seen so supposedly pictures of him on a wall or a crucifix of him in a church building. But they've never heard the truth that Jesus came and through his death upon the cross has made it possible for them to be made right with God, 
to be forgiven, to have their sins cleansed by the blood that he shed upon that cross in their behalf, and to know God in a real and personal way. They've never heard that message once. Let me tell you about a lady that I knew in the town of Yaw where I lived before we moved up here seven years ago. Her name was Siobhan. Siobhan had lived in London most of her life. She was a fluent Irish speaker. Whenever RTE needed somebody to speak in Irish on any of their programs, they contacted Siobhan because they knew she wouldn't let them down. I met Siobhan the first time on her doorstep. She actually spoke to me and a colleague in Irish. Now, I learned Irish in school. It was hammered into me for 15 years. I don't have a lot in my memory. So she asked us a question in Irish. We answered her in Irish. She asked us a second question, and through my mind, I was thinking, if this lady asks us a third question, my Irish is gone. I'm out. After the second question, she said, so you're not Jehovah's Witnesses. And that's what she used to turn them away from her doorstep, because at that time in Ireland, most, most, most of them were, were, were from England and didn't know any Irish. We went into her home, got to know this lady. Her husband was dying of cancer in the bedroom. Uh, Liam was his name. Um, Turned out he was listening to the radio program that we were involved in. But over the years, we got to know Siobhan, and I would call, I would pray with her, I'd read scripture with her, I'd give her our daily bread notes, I'd give her a gospel calendar at Christmas time, but I couldn't really get any further with her in terms of serious gospel conversation. I was praying, Lord, how do I, how do I get this lady to read more? Well, Ultimate Questions uh, is available in Irish. It's been printed in Irish by Evangelical Press. And so, this was a bit conniving, but what I said to Siobhan was, I said, Siobhan, look, I've ordered some of these ultimate questions in Irish, but my Irish isn't good enough to check to see if the translation is accurate or not. Now, that was the truth. It wasn't. So I said, Siobhan, look, if I give you a copy of the English version and a copy of the Irish version, would you mind checking to see if the Irish is good enough against the English? So they took, she took the two ultimate questions, and on her bus journey from Cork to Yall, a 40-minute bus journey each time she went into hospital, maybe for checkups or whatever, she took the ultimate questions with her. Quarter to 10 one night, she rang me on the phone. She said, Mervyn, why were we never told? I said, Siobhan, what do you mean? She said, Mervyn, growing up, we were told how sinful we were. We were told how angry God was with our sin. We were told how God would deal with us and punish us. But we were never told what Christ accomplished on the cross on our behalf. When he cried, it is finished. We were never told that it was possible to be forgiven. Now, brothers and sisters, I don't know to this day if Siobhan has ever actually put her faith and trust in the Lord Jesus. She, what she began to do was she would go to Mass at 10 o'clock on a Sunday morning. She would come across to our meeting at 11 o'clock and join us. God knows what's going on in her heart and where she stands before him. But that's the reality. There's a lady in her 70s, gone to all the church services that her church offered, and yet said to me, Mervyn, why were we never told? And brothers and sisters this evening, 70 towns in the Republic, 700 in France. There are 7,000 villages and towns in Spain this evening as we sit here in the comfort and security and freedom of Bambridge Baptist, where the name and person and fame of the Lord Jesus is not known and where he is not worshipped, and where men and women again, and boys and girls and young people have lived and are dying and going into eternity without ever hearing about him. So there are some of the needs of and what we're seeking to do as a mission is to make Christ known and see his gospel being proclaimed across this world. But before we go any further and tell you what God has been doing and the way God has been answering prayer and the way God has been calling people out to serve him and the way God has been bringing people to himself and the way new churches are coming into existence. And what I'm going to do is, if this is okay, I'm going to focus on France and Ireland in our first session and then I'm going to bring you to Peru and Spain in the after fellowship. And I hope you'll all stay, not because it's me that's speaking, but because you're hearing what God is doing through the work of our Baptist mission. So let's turn to God's word or the Psalm 100. And 45, please. Psalm 145. And while you're turning there, can I say that on the way you're going out, so you came in one side, you're going out the other side where the, 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 the church, there's, a, there's a, like a, a, 
a, t a desk or a table there, a reception desk, I suppose it is, on your way out. There's lots of Baptist missions literature there. There's a free pen for everybody. So whatever age you are, whoever you are, make sure you take a pen on the way out. A friend of mine once said, why trust your memory when the Lord has given you a biro? All right. So you'll have no excuse. The next, if you come to the missionary meeting tomorrow night, you'll have no excuse to write down what the person says, what, what, what Paul, uh, no, not Paul, uh, what Phil says tomorrow night. Uh, you'll have no excuse if you take a Baptist missions pen with you. There's also a free bookmark for everybody here as well. So as you're maybe reading your Bible or reading a good missionary biography, and young people, can I say to you, forget about trying to be like the... Uh, music stars and, and whatever else and sports people and all the rest and emulate them get some really good missionary biographies find out about men and women who've proven god in the mission field down through the centuries and you'll be thrilled at what god has done through their lives and they've done far more greater things than all the people that seek people seek to follow today get some good missionary biographies and read all about them and you can have a bookmark to mark where you are and reading those missionary biographies i've also brought a few not many because i don't want to cause any crowd problems on the way but a few prayer cards of some of our baptist missionaries here in, in, in ireland and in peru as well and there's some of those on the way out too and some of our recent uh, prayer letters so it's all there on the table on, on, on the reception desk on the way out there's a pen and a bookmark for everybody here this evening and then there's other literature there too that you can take to inform you what god is doing through the work of baptist missions but let's read god's word together as we find it in psalm 145 and we're going to read from verse 1. david's psalm of praise i will extol thee my god o king and i will bless thy name forever and ever every day will i bless thee and i will praise thy name forever and ever great is the lord and greatly to be praised, and his greatness is unsearchable. One generation shall praise thy works to another, and shall declare thy mighty acts. I will speak of the glories, honor of thy majesty, and of thy wondrous works. And men shall speak of the might of thy terrible acts, and I will declare thy greatness. They shall abundantly utter the memory of thy great goodness and shall sing of thy righteousness. The Lord is gracious and full of compassion, slow to anger and of great mercy. The Lord is good to all and his tender mercies are over all his works. All thy works shall praise thee, O Lord, and thy saints shall bless thee. They shall speak of the glory of thy kingdom and talk of thy power to make known to the sons of men his mighty acts and the glorious splendor of his kingdom. Thy kingdom is an everlasting kingdom and thy dominion endureth throughout all generations. The Lord upholdeth all that fall and raiseth up all those that be bowed down. The eyes of all wait upon thee and thou givest them their meat in due season. Who openest thine hand and satisfieth the desire of every living thing. The Lord is righteous in all his ways and holy in all his works. The Lord is nigh unto all them that call upon him, to all that call upon him in truth. He will fill the desire of them that fear him. He also will hear their cry and will save them. The Lord preserveth all that love him, but all the wicked will he destroy. My mouth shall speak the praise of the Lord, and let all flesh bless his holy name forever and ever. Let's pray for a moment. Our Father in heaven, as we sit here this evening, we acknowledge what a privileged people we are. Father, we thank you for those who took the time and the effort to tell us about Jesus. We thank you, Lord, for those who brought this gospel message to us, who spoke your word, who taught your word, who declared your glory to us and told us of our sin, yes, but told us of our Savior. Lord, we pray for men and women like Siobhan and others in this land that we live in, and across this needy world that we live in. 
Many have heard the name of Jesus, but many don't know that he came to be their Savior, to forgive them for their sins, to restore them to God. Father, we pray as we turn to your word for a moment now, would you speak to us? Would you challenge us? Lord, would you stir all our hearts and minds? May this not just be, Lord, another missionary meeting. Father, we pray, speak into our lives, we ask, speaker and listener included. For we ask it in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. There's three very brief things I want to bring out of this psalm this evening, and we haven't time to go, go through them all. Uh, it's a psalm of praise, as, as it says, David's psalm. It's the only psalm that actually is called a psalm of praise. Uh, it's a psalm that, that uh, is part of those, the next five psalms after it are psalms of praise, ending with, let everything that has breath praise the Lord. It's preceded by five psalms of prayer. And I suppose we can say this evening that praise should always come after prayer, but prayer generally probably uh, precedes praise as well. But this is a psalm of praise. It's a psalm of personal praise. Verse 1 and 2, the psalmist says, I will extol thee, my God, O King, and I will bless thy name forever. But it's also a psalm of corporate praise. Uh, verses 6 and 7, And men shall speak of the might of thy terrible acts, and I will declare thy greatness. They shall abundantly utter the memory of thy goodness, and shall sing of thy righteousness. It's a psalm of daily praise. The psalmist says, I will extol thee, my, my God, O King, and I will bless thy name forever and ever. Every day will I bless thee. So not just on a Sunday. No Sunday go to meeting Christian here. This is the psalmist saying, every day, when I wake up every morning, and, 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 and John prayed it earlier that God's mercies are new every morning, aren't they, to us? Great is his faith as we can praise him every day. And while there's daily praise, there's also eternal praise, and I will bless thy name forever and ever. Isn't that glorious this evening, brothers and sisters? We are going to be in that place one day. We're going to be in glory. We're going to be in heaven, in that new heaven and earth, where there will be no more suffering, no more sickness, no more pain, no more sin. And we will worship and praise and glorify our Savior forever and ever and ever without any end. This meeting is going to end in a few minutes. And our after meeting will end in a little while and we'll all go home and we'll all have schedules and things to be at tomorrow, school, college, work, whatever. And time will roll by. There'll be no clocks in heaven. We're going to be there forever. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. Personal praise, corporate praise, daily praise, eternal praise. But three, three truths about God I want to highlight this evening and relate them then to what God is doing through the work of Baptist Missions today. The first one is very obvious from verses 1 to 3. God is great. Look what the psalmist says in verse 3. Great is the Lord and greatly to be praised and his greatness is unsearchable. Brothers and sisters, this, this, this evening, our God is a great God. He's the God who spoke this world into being. He said, let there be light, and there was light. Go back to Genesis 1 when you get home. Six times God, it says, and God said, and six times it said, and it was so. That is our God this evening, the one who spoke this universe into being. No instruction manual, no advisors, no helpers around him, no other people to, 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 to give him uh, wisdom and counsel. Our God, Father, Son, and Holy Spirit caused this world to come into being, spoken into existence. He's the all-knowing, all-powerful one. So he's great. Great is our God and greatly to be praised. He's the king of creation. The psalmist says, I'll exalt thee, my God, O king, and I will bless thy name forever and ever. O Lord, our Lord, he wrote previously, how majestic is your name in all the earth. When I look at the heavens, the work of your hands, what is man that you are mindful of him? The earth is the Lord's and everything in it. The heavens declare the glory of God. Oh, don't you look at creation? Have you looked at creation today? The colors, the wonder, the glory, the mountains, the hills, the sun, the moon, the stars, on a, on a clear night, do we stop and do we praise and thank our God for who he is and the wonder of his creation? Then sings my soul, my Savior God to thee, how great thou 
art. Can I ask you this evening in Bambridge Baptist, can I ask you personally, can I ask you collectively, how great is your God this evening? How great is your God? Is he the God who can do exceedingly abundantly beyond all that we could ever ask or imagine? Or have we allowed the world to, to condition us into thinking and reducing our God to someone who's like an old man on a rocking chair up in heaven, wishing he could do something about this world that he lives in, but he's powerless with his hands behind his back. Brothers and sisters, the God we've come to worship here this evening is the God who is the creator and sustainer of this universe. Nothing is too difficult for him. Ah, Lord God, thou hast made the heavens and the earth by thy great power. Nothing is too difficult for thee. God is great. And he deserves all our praise and worship every day and for all eternity. God is great. How great is your God this evening? I trust that your God is the God as revealed in Scripture, that you're worshiping the one who made the heavens and the earth, the one who knows all things, the one who's sovereign over all, the God with whom nothing is impossible. God is great. But this great God is also gracious. Look at verse 8. The psalmist says, The Lord is gracious and full of compassion, slow to anger and of great mercy. The Lord is good to all and his tender mercies are over all his works. You see, people have said, haven't they, that, that power corrupts and ultimate power corrupts or absolute power corrupts absolutely. And we don't have to look too far around our world to see powerful people doing wicked things, whether we go to Afghanistan, whether we go to North Korea, wherever it might be, people in power who are doing awful things because they have the power to do so. But here's this great and mighty, awesome God who later on we're told in verse 17 is holy in all his works. And yet a God, rather than wiping us out, which would be a just thing to do if he dealt with us according to our sins, a God who is gracious and full of compassion, slow to anger and of great mercy. And how has God demonstrated his grace and his graciousness and his compassion and his mercy to us? We're seeing it in a chorus. And John, that was a, that's a favorite chorus. When I grew up as a boy and maybe some older folk here in the congregation this evening will remember, I grew up being taken along to the 830 service in the YMCA in Dublin. Uh, men like Arthur Rayner and Johnny Cochran were evangelists in the YMCA then, and we used to sing that chorus, uh, Oh, the love that drew salvation's plan. Oh, the grace that brought it down to man. Oh, the mighty gulf that God did span at Calvary. Mercy there was great, and grace was free. Pardon there was multiplied, yes, even to me. There my burdened soul found liberty at Calvary. The psalmist knew what it was, didn't he? To sin grievously against God. Against thee, thee only, have I sinned and done that which is evil in thy sight. And yet he was also able to write, Blessed is he whose transgression is forgiven, whose sin is covered. O Lord, if you marked our transgressions, who could stand? But with you there is forgiveness. And this evening, brothers and sisters, this evening, whoever you are listening or watching uh, this program this evening, here's the thing, here's the glorious thing about the God of creation, the God of heaven. He is a great God, but he's a great and merciful God as well. And he's demonstrated that grace and mercy to us by coming into this world himself in the person of his son, the Lord Jesus Christ, the only one who's ever lived in this world, who's never sinned. This is my beloved son in whom I am well pleased. There's no one else in all of history that God has ever spoken those words over. There's no one else who's ever lived like the Lord Jesus has never said a wrong word, never spoke a wrong word, never did a wrong deed. Unlike all of us here in this building this evening, and the scripture says we all have sinned and fallen short of the glory of God. And I don't know about you, but I can honestly say about me, if somebody said, listen, listen, Reverend, turn off your PowerPoint, we've got a better thing to watch this evening. We've got a video, actually, of all the things you've ever said and done and thought in your life. You know what? I wouldn't be waiting till the end of the service. I'd be out that door because I'd be ashamed for you to know what I have done and said and thought. But God knows it all. God knew it all even before I was born. God knew it all as Christ hung upon that cross because while I was yet a sinner, 
Jesus came and died in my place. And friend, this evening, that's true of you as it is true of me. There's no one in this room good enough to meet God and their own merits. But there's no one here who's done anything bad enough that cannot be forgiven by what Christ has done on the cross through his blood that was shed there in our place. Oh, we sing, don't we? Guilty, vile, and helpless we. Spotless lamb of God was he. Full atonement, full forgiveness. Can it be? Is it possible? Yes, it is. Hallelujah. What a Savior. The Lord is gracious and full of compassion. Can I ask you, do you know this great God this evening? Do you know this gracious God? Have you come to him and recognizing your sin, owning up to your sin, and putting your faith and trust in the only one who can save you, the one who came down from heaven, who died upon a cross, who rose again from the dead, and is alive today, seated at the right hand of God, and he ever lives, and he can save unto the uttermost all who come unto God through faith in him. That's the gospel we want to proclaim in France, in Ireland, in Peru, and in Spain. Our God is great. Our God is gracious. And finally, our God is gathering. Look at verses 18 and 19. I know I've left a lot out and there's a lot more to do. And your pastors will preach this again another time and fill it all in for you. But look at verses 18. Look at verses 18 and 19. The Lord is near, nigh unto all them that call upon him. To all that call upon him in truth, he will fulfill the desire of them that fear him. He will also hear their cry and he will save them. Oh, friends, this evening, not only do we have a great God, not only do we have a gracious God, but we have a gathering God. We have a God who's gathering a people to himself from every kindred and tribe and tongue and age, who's calling men and women and young people and boys and girls to saving faith in his Son, even as we sit here in Banbridge this evening. But here's the challenge on your missionary weekend and your missionary convention, because Paul says in Romans 10, for whoever shall call upon the name of the Lord shall be saved. But how then shall they call on him in whom they have not believed? And how shall they believe in him of whom they have not heard? In those 70 towns, in those 700 towns and villages, in those 7,000 towns and villages, and how shall they hear without a preacher? And how shall they preach except they be sent? As it is written, how beautiful are the feet of them that preach the gospel of peace and bring glad tidings of good things. Can I ask you this evening, what kind of feet do you have? Now, I'm not getting personal. Some of you might say, well, I've got lovely feet. You might be sitting beside somebody and you're thinking, ooh, that person's got a bit smelly feet. Can I ask you this evening, do you have beautiful feet? Beautiful feet as Paul describes them here. Are you somebody willing to go, to leave maybe the comfort of home and family, to leave maybe all the ambitions of a career and money and home and possessions and things, and leave it all behind for the sake of those who've never heard the gospel once and say, God helping me, with his spirit within me, with the promise of Jesus never to leave me or forsake me and to be with me wherever I go, I'll go and take this gospel to men and women who've never heard. I'll go and speak of this great God, this gracious God, and this God who is gathering a people to himself. I'll make him known that, th that others may be gathered with that number that the psalmist calls. You see, at the beginning of the psalm, He's praising God on his own. But look at the very end, the very last verse. He says, My mouth shall speak the praise of the Lord, and let all flesh, or let all peoples, bless his holy name forever and ever. You see, he's not content to just worship God on his own. He wants to be part of a number from across the nations who'll be gathering together to worship his great God. Go back and read that psalm you get home because it speaks about personal witness. It also speaks about corporate witness. It wasn't the psalmist's job to reach the nations, just like it's not your pastor's job to reach people in Bam Bridge. It's not their job to reach everybody. You have work colleagues and friends in school, young people, and, and friends in college that your pastors or your church elders will never meet. 
they will never rub shoulders with, they will never know. And those people, you alone, will have the opportunity to be the witness to them, to tell them of Christ, to reach them while you can. And the role of your pastors, if I understood Ephesians 4 right, is to equip all of you to leave this building this evening, to go out and to do those works of mercy to the community around you, to be the light and salt that this town and this area so desperately needs. Let me take you to France in the time we have remaining. The land of France, 60 million people, 10% of whom are from a Muslim background. So there are 6 million Muslim people living in France this evening. Now, God has been at work in France in the last number of years. In the last four decades, there have been 1,200 new evangelical churches planted in France. And that might sound like a lot, particularly when there's only 117 in the Association of Irish Baptist Churches. 1,200 sounds, whoa, that's a lot. But remember, 60 million people. So here's the thing. There is one evangelical church, I'm told, for every 753 people in Bangor County down this evening. Now, I haven't done the maths, so if it's wrong, don't come knock on my door. But one evangelical church in Bangor for every 753 people. There's one evangelical church in France this evening for every 33,000 people. Now, I don't know how many people live in Banbridge. Anybody know? No. But I don't think it's probably much. Is it 40,000, 50,000? Maybe less? But let's say Banbridge was in France this evening. The reality is that you could be living in a town like Banbridge with no evangelical church in it at all. Now, I, I would, I'm quick to say that I, I suspect that Banbridge Baptist isn't the only evangelical church in Banbridge this evening. There's at least one other, I'm sure, John, <laughs> where the gospel has been preached tonight, right? But if you're living in France, young people, there'd be no group to come to this evening. There'll be no after church fellowship. There'll be no Christian friend in school. You might be the only one if there is one at all, but you wouldn't even have a church to come to. But God has been working in France. God has been answering prayer. And back in December 2014, a group of us began to meet together. We just called it French Connections. We began to meet to pray for France. I was burdened as I came into this role seven years ago that France had gone off the mission's radar, if you like. That Our last missionaries had come home from France a number of years ago, and we hadn't sent anybody out to replace them. Well, God has been answering prayer, and God has been stirring people. And a young lady who was actually from France, who studied at the Irish Baptist College, has come back to the city of Marseille that teaches her name. Now, the city of Marseille doesn't have 10% Muslim population, has a 40% Muslim population. And Letitia's gone back to work primarily among students in the city of Marseille. And because this is going out live, I'm not going to go into a whole lot of detail this evening, but here's the thing. There are people being reached in the city of Marseille through the work that Letitia's doing and her colleague Miriam, coming from countries in the world where we cannot go to the gospel ordinarily, where we cannot preach the gospel in the, in the open air in an open way, but they're there studying in Marseille and they're being reached with the gospel. They came to Bible studies last year that Letitia and her colleague put on. They came to online Bible studies when lockdown came and those girls used all kinds of means that they could to reach out to these students coming from North Africa, the Middle East. I'm not naming the countries tonight, but you can fill in the details yourselves. People getting around the Word of God, people being taken from Genesis, Exodus, Leviticus, through the Old Testament, having never read the Scriptures before, having never handled the Bible before. Now think with me for a moment as we sit here in Brown Bridge this evening. Think what our great and gracious God could do. Imagine, just imagine for a moment, if God, using these two girls, and they're in dangerous situations at times, so pray for their protection, Imagine if God used these girls and the gospel penetrated hearts and minds of men and women from some of those countries that we cannot go to and they were to be saved and they were to be discipled and they were to grow in the grace and knowledge of the Lord and Savior Jesus Christ and they were to get the vision to go back to their homelands where they know the language, where they know the culture, where they have friends and family and neighbors. Imagine what God might do. Now those people may pay the ultimate price for having become a follower of Jesus Christ in the first instance. But imagine through two girls in Marseille how God might be spreading his word and bringing the gospel to some of those lands where we cannot go to because he's brought them to our shores. I don't know why God's allowing all that's going on in Afghanistan. I'm not going to sit here tonight and, and pontificate because I'm too ignorant to, to, to really know. But here's what I do know. 
There will be people from Afghanistan coming to these shores, maybe coming to live in Banbridge, maybe people that, humanly speaking, would never have heard the gospel if the trouble in Afghanistan had not happened. But God has sent these people over to our countries that maybe through here they can hear the gospel. Banbridge Baptist, are you ready? Are you ready to reach out to Afghans who come to live in your town and share the gospel with them? Not to be afraid of them, not to fear them, but actually to see our great and gracious God gathering people even from those places to himself. The young man, Andrew Livingstone, and he's coming here in a couple of weeks' time. He's a friend of Peter's. I think they're a Bible college together in Edinburgh. He'll be here in a couple of weeks' time with his, with his wife, Sephora. Now, listen up, young people. He went to France last August a single man. On the 1st of May... He married the love of his life, uh, and, he'd be, and she'll be here with him in uh, September, uh, in two weeks' time, and they can explain how all that happened, and he can, he can introduce his wife to you and tell you all that they're doing in, this, in, the, in, in a town called La Rode in France. But I'll let Andrew speak for himself and Sephora when they're here in a couple of weeks. But a young family from County Kildare, burdened by God, called by God to go and serve in France, left their farm. Now, brothers and sisters, if I had pictures tonight, I could, I could show you an idyllic farmhouse overlooking rich pasture land in the county of Kildare, beautiful garden, beautiful surroundings. They've left it all. And tonight they're living in a flat in a place called Eglaton in France, and they don't even have a garden. Will you pray for them? But you know what they said to me the other day on the phone? David Sandler said to me, Mervyn, we're happy out. We know we are what God means us to be. We haven't got a garden. The girls are missing their pet dog. Da, da, da. But we believe we are where God wants us to be. Last Thursday, those three girls went into school for the first time. And here's the lovely thing, how God answers prayer. Their middle daughter, they've got three daughters, and here, young people, I want you to pray. I want you to commit yourself to praying for these three girls. Eva, who's 11, Emma, who's 10, and Abby, who's 8. Eva, Emma, Abby. But Emma, who's 10, the middle girl was really anxious about going to school. They don't speak French. Going to a French school without the language, very anxious and hesitant. On Tuesday, they got an opportunity to go into the school and meet their teachers. Emma discovered that her teacher had an English-French dictionary sitting on her desk. She discovered that her teacher has sat her beside a boy who goes to the church that they're attending. And on the other side is a special needs assistant with a special needs child to the right of the special needs assistant, but the special needs assistant speaks fluent English. Now, you couldn't have asked for a better situation. Praise God for answering the prayer. Do you know what? Already, the Sandals, even though we've sent them to France initially to learn the language, they've met people from Jordan, from Somalia, from Afghanistan, and French people too, and they've had the opportunity to share the gospel with people already from those different countries. Will you pray for them? Pray to settle in to the town of Eglaton. Pray that God will keep them safe. Pray that they will be able to learn the language. Pray that as they share the gospel, that they'll see people come to faith in Christ. The town has about 1,500 to 2,000 students who are going to pour into the, the city, into the town over the next few weeks. It's a student town. Uh, sorry, it's, it's, it's a university town. Um, so will you pray as those students come as well, there'll be opportunity to reach them. They have a cafe that they're working in as well, that God has opened doors for gospel advancement in the land of France through the Sandal family. And Eva, Emma, and Abby, I'm asking you folks this evening to remember those three girls in prayer. Will you pray that those three girls, rather than growing up to be bitter and angry, that the parents took them away to a foreign land, to a foreign place, where they left their family and their friends and their grandparents and all the rest and cousins behind. They won't become bitter and angry, but actually they grow up to love the Lord Jesus, to serve him and to see the reason why their parents left the idyllic home they had and went to a land where people uh, did not know Jesus and that they too might have the joy of serving him in time to come. Let me take you to Ireland for a minute. Uh, and again, during lockdown, during 2020, what was God doing during COVID? What was happening? Well, do you know what? God was calling people like the Sands, like Letitia, to go and serve him. And he was working in the hearts and minds of, of um, this couple as well, Tim and Arlene McFarlane. Tim had been serving as the assistant pastor in Cartmel Cross Baptist. So watch out, Peter. This is what happens to assistant pastors, you know. They get called into church planting work. And so now uh, they're still living in Cartmel Cross, but they're reaching into the towns of Casablanca and RD, where 
again, there's no known vibrant evangelical witness in either of those towns. Now, Cartmel Cross sits in between Castleblaney and R.D., uh, R.D. is about 15 miles to the south of Carrick Macross. Castle Blaine is about 17 miles to the north of Carrick Macross. So you pray for this young couple as they begin to reach out to those areas, as they begin to reach people in these towns, that God will be at work, that God by His Spirit will be bringing that conviction of sin and judgment and righteousness, and that they'll meet people who are hungry to be right with God, hungry to know about the Word of God, hungry to know about the truth of God, and that we would see little gospel lights shining. Now, I was in Katy this morning, where a new Baptist church was formed uh, this morning in the town of Katy. Who would have thought? And you know what? Pastor Armstrong's wife was there, the late Pastor Armstrong who served in Armagh Baptist for many years, who in the, in the 60s, at his own expense, had posted gospel literature to every home in South Armagh, Katy, Newton Hamilton, Cross McGlen, wherever, and he'd prayed and longed to see churches being planted in that area. Along came the troubles and put an end to an awful lot of that kind of work. But this morning, in answer to his and many other people's prayers and the labors of previous generations and of today's generation, a new church was formed in Katy in South Armagh. Our great and gracious God is gathering people to himself. And here's the joy, friends. There were 11 founding members from Armagh Baptist, but there were 12 others from the town of Katy some of whom have only come to faith and been baptized in recent days. Hallelujah. God is at work. And you see Castle Blaney? It's the next town on the gospel map. If you drive from Katy South, you come to Castle Blaney. Will you pray that as God has now raised up a church and a people to himself in Katy, he would do the same in Castle Blaney and in RD as well and bless the church in Carrick Cross in the meantime. Shane Dean, I think, has been here before. I think you all love Shane Dean. Uh, he's a great speaker. Uh, he's an enthusiastic guy. He's coming back on deputation, hopefully, in the next couple of weeks. I don't think he's come to Banbridge this time. But Passage Baptist Church was formed in June. Now, they didn't have a public service like we had in Katie this morning. Uh, there was no fanfare because of COVID. Just had 12 members who covenanted together after a morning service to form a Baptist witness in the town of Passage. And they're calling it Passage Baptist. Baptist Church. Praise God for that little group of believers meeting in that town. Will you pray that God will add to their number those who are being saved? The only way to grow when you have 12 members is to see people coming to faith in Jesus Christ, seeing the gospel reaching people and people coming from darkness to light. That's a really needy town. You've had Shane here before. There's an awful lot of addiction, an awful lot of, of alcoholism, drug addiction, all kinds of problems in passage. Will you pray that God would break into the darkness and rescue people and bring them to himself? And finally, I want to mention that the Marcus family serving in Belturbet in County Cavan, which again is not that far from here. But here's the joy. Again, a number of people have been praying. The church in Cavan Town has been working into Belturbet. Joel and Katja Marcus, Katja's from Russia uh, originally, uh, serving together in Belturbet. And on Saturday, the 18th of September, a new Baptist church is going to be formed. Again, I think they're hoping to have maybe about 18 or so founding members uh, in Belturbet on the 18th of September. Will you pray for that little group? Will you pray God's protection upon Joel and Katja and the three boys? Will you pray as that church comes into existence, that again, God would add to the number in time. Now, they've seen men, they've seen a couple of men saved in recent days. There were three people uh, uh, baptized, or two people baptized recently. God has been at work. His word has been at work. Our great and gracious God has been saving people in the town of Bill Turbot. And little gospel light is now flickering in that town. And maybe you might say to me, well, Mervyn, your maths are bad, because if 70 you said a minute ago, well, yes, yeah, 69 then, all right? Um, but there's a lot more uh, to do. Um, and it all begins with prayer. Friends, this evening, can I ask you, if you don't normally receive our prayer news, can I ask you this evening to go home and pray and ask God, Lord, would you have me pray for those three little girls in France and their mum and dad? Would you have me pray for Letitia and her colleague Miriam in Marseille working in a dangerous situation? Lord, would you have me remember what's going on in Carrick Macross and Castle Blay and RD? You won't remember tonight all that I've said. But if you sign up for our prayer news on our website, irishbaptistmissions.org, young people, you can go onto our website on your phone later on. 
fill in your details, and three o'clock next Friday afternoon, you'll get our prayer news. And every two weeks, it covers the whole of our Baptist missions work. And finally, I'm going to leave you this challenge this evening. We're seeking to raise up not just only a thousand new prayer supporters, mainly from a younger generation, but we want to see a thousand new people giving to the work of mission as well. And we're simply asking people to consider giving 10 pounds a month to the work of Baptist Mission. Now, thank you as a church for your generosity towards Baptist Missions in your prayers and your giving. We are really grateful for you here in Banbridge Baptist for your generosity to us as a mission. But maybe there's somebody here this evening, and I hope I really want to speak to younger people in particular. If you're, and I'm 53, so anything below that's young now, all right? Um, here's the thing. What we're looking for is to raise up a thousand new people who say, do you know what? I'll give 10 pounds a month because I've heard the gospel so many times. I want somebody somewhere to hear it once. Now, I'm not asking you to give 10 pounds less to this church or 10 pounds less to any other mission. But what I'm asking you to consider is this. Would you go without one less takeaway coffee a, month, a week? Or one less Chinese a month? Or one less car wash a month? And say, do you know what? I don't need those things but I'm going to put that extra 10 pounds towards the work of Baptist missions so that young people, men and women, will hear about Jesus Christ. Now, you say to me, Mervyn, what can 10 pounds do? Well, to be honest, 10 pounds can't do an awful lot. But a 1,000 people giving 10 pounds and God blessing it, and if you can gift aid it, that even goes a bit further. That can make a huge difference. And I would say to you, through this past year of 2020, in COVID times, when churches weren't meeting, when church giving dropped to Baptist missions because churches weren't meeting, do you know what carried us along, kept us afloat, and kept our head above water? Was those 10 pounds a month trickling in from individuals who said, you know what, I'll give a little bit more, and maybe have a little bit less for myself, but I'll give a little bit more that others may hear about Jesus. The psalmist longed for the day when all flesh, when all peoples, will bless God's name forever. That's what the work of mission is all about, taking the gospel of God to the ends of the earth so that others may be there on that final day praising and worshiping our great and gracious God too. Our time is gone, but we want to stand and sing our closing hymn, Eternal God, we come to you with thankful hearts. And can I encourage you to just use this song as a prayer as we end our service this evening and really go home, or well, not go home just now, stay uh, to hear about Spain and Peru, what God is doing there too. But look to God to ask him how you might be more involved in seeing his gospel be proclaimed across this world. Let's stand and sing, Eternal God, we come to you.
Father, we pray you would indeed help us to keep our eyes fixed upon Jesus, the author and perfecter of our faith. And Lord, may we long for your coming. And until you come, may we be found doing what you've commanded us to do, making disciples of all nations. Lord, we pray, give us more of your concern for the lost we ask. Send us from this place, Lord, eager and desires to see our great and gracious God gathering more people to himself for the glory of your name. For we ask it for Jesus' sake. Amen. Amen.